we're using this book, Ethics of the Soul, but also kind of you can use, use chapters of the fathers at home. So the first one, we're in chapter four. Let's open up to chapter four, Mishnah six. This is an interesting Mishnah. It's Rabbi, it says, Rabbi Ishmael, his son said, one who learns in order to teach. Okay. Someone who learns in order to teach, it is granted to them to study and teach. One who learns in order to practice it is granted to them to learn and to teach and to practice. So somebody who learns in order to practice, someone who learns in order to teach. So if you're learning Torah in order to teach somebody else, then you'll know, you'll know, um, you'll know how to study, you'll learn, and you also teach. So if you're learning in order to teach, you'll know how, you'll learn the material for yourself, you know what to teach other people. If you're learning in order to practice the halachas or whatever you're learning in order to put it into practice, through that, you'll not only learn, you'll not only know how to teach what you're learning because you'll know it well enough, you will be able to practice and implement it in your life. So really, learning for the sake of doing is very beneficial because it enables you to really know what this topic you've studied is and be able to teach it as well and also be able to implement it. That's the teaching of the Mishnah. Now, one of my rabbis once pointed out that there's one type of learning that's very clearly missing here. And this is oftentimes the, the type of learning that goes on in, in yeshiva world. Learning for the sake of learning, right? So it says learning for the sake of teaching, learning for the sake of doing, but it doesn't say here learning for the sake of learning. So one of my rabbis once pointed out, he criticized the classic way of learning in yeshiva where he said, listen, it's not, it's not just about theoretical, theoretical learning. We should learn in order to help other people, in order to teach or in order to, um, to do and bring, it, bring our teachings out into the world. So that's why it doesn't say learning for the sake of learning. In my commentary, I talked about how oftentimes um, we find ourselves in religious circles kind of talking about high values, ideals, helping the community. But really, um, the purpose of that learning should not just be for learning, just for discussing among ourselves, but rather in order for us to teach other people these values and implement them and help our community when it comes to those specific things we're talking about. So that's why, that's why I think it's a beautiful, a beautiful way to understand this. Really, learning about racism, learning about injustice, learning about poverty, learning about things that are ailing our community and our society, it's not enough just to talk about them or learn about them or get together to teach about them. We have to learn them in order to teach about these things to other people, to educate people on the wrongs of injustice, wrongs of racism, and any type of social action piece. And in addition, it's not just enough to learn in order to teach. We ourselves have to implement it and make the community better and improve our community on those fronts. Fight against injustice, fight against racism, try to end, try to work towards ending poverty and, and negative things that are going on in our community. So this, I view this Mishnah as a, as a call to social action. It, it, it uh, strengthens our, res, uh, our resolve to not just talk about the good things, but to teach and educate others about them, and in addition to implement them and to change things in reality. So that's a piece on social action. I want to move to chap Mishnah chapter four, Mishnah eight. Here are, I want to talk about at least two or three Mishnahs connected to self-esteem and self-worth and boundaries. So this Mishnah is a beautiful Mishnah. Um, this explanation I'm going to offer, I really connect to, um, kind of in my life as well, personally. So it says like this. This is Mishnah chapter 4, Mishnah 8. Rabbi Yossi said, whoever honors the Torah is themselves honored by others. Whoever dishonors the Torah is themselves dishonored by others. So whoever gives honor to the Torah, they've connected to Torah, which is a very honorable thing. And through that, they've elevated themselves and people will honor them as well. That's a simple reading of it. But I want to read this a little bit differently. Uh, many times people who are observant, religious, they believe that for themselves to gain credibility and honor and respect around those who are less religious than themselves, many times they will downplay their religiosity. They'll, they'll hide it so they can gain acceptability. I think our mission is saying the opposite. Who, who, whoever, who is due honor, I mean, who... Whoever honors the Torah is themselves honored by others. What does that mean? Whoever honors their own Torah, whoever respects their religious level, whoever um, embraces their religiosity and does not hide from it, does not try to hide it from other people, rather is authentically Jewish, authentically proud of who they are. They themselves 
through that authenticity, we'll gain honor and respect through other people. It's the opposite of what you might think. People honor people who respect and honor themselves. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be nice and kind to those who are not observant around you. The opposite. You should be as kind and nice as possible. But you shouldn't hide your religiosity. You should be proud of who you are. Be authentic. And with that, extend yourself in the most kind way to people around you. That will lead them to respect you and honor you because you're being true to yourself. You're being authentic and you're not hiding your religiosity. So that's the idea. Respect yourself and your religiosity and you're re respected by other people. That's what it, what it means by whoever honors the Torah is themselves honored by others. Similarly, those who dishonor the Torah are dishonored by others because they don't gain that same respect due to, the, their, due to their inauthenticity. inauthenticity. Okay, let's go to chapter 4, Mishnah 4, 14. Here's a, a beautiful Mishnah. It says, this is uh, Rabbi Yochanan Asandlar said, every assembly which is for the sake of heaven will in the end endure. endure. Every assembly which is not for the sake of the, in heaven will in the end not endure. So simple reading is like this. A, a gathering that comes together, a group that comes together for proper and ideal reasons, for the right motives, that group will continue to come together um, and join together because they're fighting for a common positive cause. A group that comes together, people that come together for ulterior motives, um, when they're when they're in that gathering together, they might be dealing with that specific situation at that moment. But when that ulterior motive is, has been removed, they no longer um, are joined together. Let's think of like a social action cause where somebody's coming together for the right reasons. They'll continue to to join together so they can continue to fight that negative or fight to, to improve that reality in the world. But somebody who's coming together under the guise of a social action cause, but they're really doing it to gain money or to pocket money, when they no longer are getting the money anymore, they'll no longer come together and gather with those um, who are gathering around that topic. So that's basically the idea of those who are gathering together for the sake of heaven, if they do it for the sake of he heaven, the, the, the group will continue to endure. That's the simple reading of it. But I want to read it differently. I want to say like this: It's not just talking about the. Con it's not just talking about um, gathering, but it's it's talking about how we can assess if we are ourselves in a gathering for the sake of heaven. If we are ourselves joining others for the right reasons, how can we assess that? We can assess that by seeing if um, if there's if there's lead kayem. It says here, uh, every assembly that's for the sake of heaven will, will endure. The language of kiyum could also hint to our motives. If our motives are those types of motives which will endure, which are kiyum, which are lasting, then we will, we are we ourselves are in an assembly for the sake of heaven. We are in assembly for the sake of heaven. What does that mean? Sometimes when you're in a, in a group and you're speaking from a place that's not enduring, that's not authentic, that's not alive, you can really tell if you are really in a group for the right reasons. Sometimes you're in a, in, you're joining a group, you're in a fight with somebody, you're in a, in a dialogue, you're in a debate, and you're speaking, but you can sense that you're speaking from a non-enduring place. You're not really speaking from your core. You're speaking from some sort of place of ego. You're speaking to some sort of hurt feeling that uh, from, from, from the past. When you're speaking from a place that's not enduring, not from your deeper core, those types of meetings are not for the sake of heaven. If you want to really know if you're in assembly for the sake of heaven, check if it's mit kayem. If your speech, your motives, your directives are from a place of endurance, of, of enduring, from your inner core. If it's from your inner core, that's a sign that you're in an assembly that might be for the sake of heaven. So that's a different way to read it. It's not just saying, um, it's it's not just saying that if you have a group that is for the sake of heaven that it will endure, but rather, how do you know that you're in a group that's for the sake of heaven? Check if your motives are from enduring place. If it's from your core, there's more hope that you are indeed in an assembly for the sake of heaven. So I wanna read uh, two, uh, another Mishnah connected to self-esteem, and this is chapter four, Mishnah 19. This is also, I really connect this explanation, but I happen to write written it, so that's why I connect to it, but it, it's a powerful one. So here, as Rabbi and I said, is not in our hands either the security of the wicked or the afflictions of the righteous. The simple explanation is this. We do not fully understand. It's not in our hands to understand why the righteous suffer and why the wicked might prosper. It's not in our hands. We can't grasp it in our knowledge. It's usually, it's usually um, deals with our understanding, but I'm gonna offer a different explanation. Many, this is connects to self-esteem as well. So that's the topic we're in. We did two missions. We did the first mission of social action. We're doing, we did two more missions on self-esteem. Here's another one on self-esteem. Then we're going to shift to relationships. So 
many times when, when things are going wrong around us, people are, people are um, suffering or some sort of calamity has happened to us, maybe we're very times, many times we're very quick to, judge, to blame ourselves. We're very quick to blame our hands. We see our hands as being responsible for the bad things that happen to us. Some sort of bad tragedy happened in our family. Um, we might think, what did I do wrong to cause this? How did it, maybe I wasn't religious enough. Maybe something caused it. There are, we have to check our part, look at where our hands played a part in bad things that are happening around us. But the mission is reminding us that it's not our fault. Meaning there are many things that are beyond our hands. Beyond our hands. Sometimes people around us are just bad and they have free will and therefore they're, act, they're acting negatively. Sometimes Hashem has a grand plan for why Hashem wants things to happen in our world. Don't over blame yourself. I think that's what the Mishnah is saying. It's not in our hands all of the sufferings in the world of the righteous and why the wicked are, are prospering. We're, we didn't cause this. We might have played a part. And we have to take a set. We have to assess that. But beyond that, we shouldn't blame ourselves. We should know that there are other factors involved as well. So that's kind of like a, uh, I guess, like a, an empowering explanation in the sense that many times some people, many times people will blame themselves uh, when they're not really at blame. I want to shift to chapter 4, Mishnah 15. This Mishnah talks about um, I, would, I would say heavenly relationships. How to build a relationship with others um, that would be, that, how, to, how to be in a relationship with others and to, to flourish in that relationship from a Jewish perspective. So this Mishnah says, let the honor, this is Rabbi Elazar ben Shemua says, let the honor of your student be as dear to you as your own, and the honor of your friend as the reverence of your teacher, and the reverence of your teacher as the reverence of heaven. There are really multiple players here. We have uh, your student, then we have your friend, then we have your teacher, then we have the reverence of heaven. And the Maral says these are all connected. All these are connected, and one basically should lead into the other. So based on the Maharal's reading, he says like this, um, that your, the honor of your students should be as dear to you as your friends. And the honor of your friend as the reverence of your teacher, and the reverence of your teacher as the reverence of heaven. I read this to kind of like as a continuation. All these relationships are connected and they all end up in the final one. This should be like this, this should be like that, and that should be like that. In the end, they really should all connect to this final stage, which is the reverence of heaven. And I think this is hinting to how we should see our relationships around us as connected to heaven in order for us to flourish in that connection. Many times we will be around people around us and we will not, we'll be um, struggling to accept certain parts of the connection. We might um, be upset at them, might not want to be connected to them at all, but many times we don't have a choice over that. And it might be our family, it might be those around us who we love, but we're just struggling with in that moment. The message here is to see the relationships not just as, uh, not just as placed in our lives randomly, but rather as divine relationships. Hashem placed teachers in our lives. Hashem placed friends in our lives. Hashem placed students in our lives. By the fact that these are all connected one after another, in the end to the reverence of heaven, I'm seeing this as hinting to the fact that we should see these all as extending from heaven. If we see our spouses as a present from Hashem, if we see our students as given to us from Hashem, if we see our teachers as those appointed to us by Hashem, by God, we can connect to those relationships better and be, be able to see them as a present from Hashem. If we see them as a present from Hashem, we can embrace them and try to analyze and see what good we can take from them. So I think this mission is not just, is hitting to us that these relationships in our lives are not just stam, not just happenstance, but rather they're placed in our life by Hashem. That, will, that should enable us to see them as heavenly, enable us to accept them as wonderful presents from Hashem, and enable us also to see them, the student, the teacher, the friend, as um, positive as a positive thing and try to search in those connections for the positive because Hashem placed them in our lives. So that's that. That's one more piece in heavenly relationships. One more Mishnah I want to talk about in the, in just like the two minutes we have left <clears throat> is uh, Mish chapter 4, Mishnah 20. This talks, in my based on my explanation, on healthy, balanced relationships. <clears throat> so we have here, it says, Rabbi Matia ben Harash, page 173 in my book. Rabbi Mat Matia ben Harash said, Upon meeting people, be the first to extend greetings and be a tail into lions and not a head into foxes. So I think it's talking about two types of connections. We have the first part talking about meeting people. All kinds of people are around. Try to be nice to them and kind to them. We have to be as kind as we can. Extend greetings to others. That's everyone. Now, when it comes to social groups that we might be involved in, that's the second part of this mission here. When it says, 
lions and foxes. Lions go around with their pack and, and foxes as well. That's social groups, not just every individual, but social groups. When you're around social groups, you might have to be a little bit more careful because sometimes uh, you can be giving and kind, extending greetings, and those individuals can take advantage of you. So this is the lesson of the Mishnah. Do not try to be a head, do not be a head of the foxes. Foxes I view as sly opportunistic people. Be kind to them, be nice to them, but do not lead them all the time. If you're being kind and giving and leading to them, always giving to them nonstop, they'll just continuously take from you. That could be toxic and negative. So it's telling us, do not be ahead unto foxes. Foxes are sly opportunistic people. Be careful of that. That could be dangerous to you. And again, we're talking about relationships here. Rather, be ahead to the to um, try, be the arayot to the lions. What are lions? Lions are like the head of the of the of the, um, of the jungle. They are um, they are independent. So individuals who are able to take care of themselves and they're not out just to uh, in an opportunistic way take from you nonstop. Those are the individuals you want to sur sur um, surround yourselves with. You want to be more around those individuals who are more like lions when you're in a social group. Everyone, they're able to take care of themselves and you're also able to give to them and to receive from them as well. So you are a, a tail to the lions. You are part of that group of individuals who will not only take from you like the, like the foxes, but rather they'll give to you as well. They're able to lead you as well. That's the kind of group you want to be involved with. This mission says, with regards to everybody around you, like kind of like just your, your connections on a day-to-day -day basis, people who you surround yourself with, be kind to them and nice to them. When it comes to groups you're with on a consistent basis, stay away from those groups that will make you the head and just exploit you or take advantage of you. Try to be around, those are the foxes. Try to be around the lions, those who are, are self-sustaining, those who can take care of themselves and tend to themselves, who will take from you, but they will be able to lead you as well and give to you in the relationship as well. So basically today we talked about social action. We talked about not just learning, but rather teaching the values of Judaism to improve the world and to, to do. And we learned about uh, taking care of yourself, that if you respect yourself, you'll be respected by others. We learned about speaking from an enduring place, from your core. That's a sign that you're in a group that's for the sake of heaven, that you're in a group that's a, that's, that's a that, that you're in a, in a debate or discussion that's for the sake of heaven because you're speaking from a real place. We talked about seeing things around you, not just as your fault, right? Sometimes things that we do, sometimes things we do, do influence our reality around us, but it's not all the time. There are factors that are involved that are beyond our hands. That's important to remember. When it comes to relationships, to see those around us placed in our lives as divine relationships, as them as a plan. What good can I receive from this relationship and how can I really value my spouse, my loved ones, those around me, because they are a present from Hashem. And we learned that out from the connection between all those, friend, teacher, student, to their relationship in the end, which is the reverence of heaven. They're all interconnected. So we're seeing that as emanating from Hashem. Finally, we talked about being around groups who will be able to give to you and not you just constantly, consistently giving to them and being taken advantage of. So that's a little bit on social action, the broader community, ourselves, and others. Join us next week for more discussions from chapter five of Ethics of the Fathers. Have a beautiful day.